So this was a Lee chess game, and Max introduces this as follows. I am white. I could feel my opponent's opening didn't develop enough pieces, but I didn't figure out how to open the position to take advantage. Then I was in time trouble, and things were chaotic, and I blundered the game away. But I am most curious how to think about closed positions like this. All right, great. Let's jump in. This is a long game, so I might have to go a little bit fast here. All right, so e4, g6, so we have a modern. d6, knight f3, h6, yeah, so I can see what you're talking about. Your opponent's just pushing all of his pawns out. Bishop c4, so developing well so far, and e6. All right, so for now, you're just developing your pieces and you're doing a good job of it. <laughs> g5, all right. All right, so your opponent really asking for it here, but this can be very hard to play against. I acknowledge that. And I've talked about this on the speedrun. This can be very, very hard to play against. All right. Now, in this position, I would indicate a very interesting plan. The moment your opponent plays g5, I'm looking at this pawn and I'm saying, this is a pretty significant hook, right? Because one of the main avenues of attack in such positions is the f-file. And if you've watched some of my games, you know that I love opening up the f-file, particularly if your opponent is not castled. So what would be a method of trying to get this F file open as quickly as possible. And it looks like a very bad move. See, the reason a lot of you guys, I think, would hesitate to play this move is that it looks passive in and of itself, knight e1. But we're not playing knight e1 to improve the knight, we're playing it because we have to. If I had a more active square for the knight, I would do it, but I'm trying to play F4 as quickly as possible. So knight e1, and if your opponent would have developed, boom, goes the dynamite F4, and he has no choice but to allow the f file to get opened. Um, g takes f4, bishop takes f4, and you can try to put your queen on h5, and already white's got a clear pathway toward attacking black's king, if that makes sense. I love that reference too. So I would propose that as one idea. Now, if queen b6, you can just drop the bishop back to e3 and defend the d2 pawn. And if queen takes b2, I, um, you know, I, I wouldn't care about that. I would just go knight a4, for example. Queen b, oh no, actually, let me see. I mean, maybe just knight e2. I wouldn't mind retreating more and then maybe rerouting this knight to g3 and h5. Wait, Max, I'm not sure if you're being sarcastic. Mr. Mopey Dick, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're being sarcastic. Do you want me to explain this uh, more deeply? So why why is this good? Oh, you see it? Okay, okay. I wasn't sure if you were <laughs> if you were saying that sarcastically. Okay. So that would be a good plan. Now, you played rookie one. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, a lot of you guys are thinking about d5 here. Why not open up the center? And this is a very... Uh, this is what I what my sixth grade math teacher would call the mupwa, the most popular wrong answer. This is a move that looks very good. But the problem is that he can keep the position closed. He can play c takes d5, e takes d5, and then e5. And it's just, you know, we haven't accomplished very much to open up the position. You can try rook e1, and you can try to sacrifice on e5, but if he develops in a timely manner and then plays knight e7, what could end up happening is that you've actually done some damage uh, to the king side, and black is now the one who has the easier job attacking on the king side. So. For instance, if you just develop here, black's gonna go f5, and guess what? Th those are some pretty intimidating pawns, I have to say. Um, so you gotta take this concept of opening up the position with a pretty serious grain of salt. You played rookie one, that's patient, I like it. Knight d7, and now you play d5, which I think is a much better version of playing this move, so you did a great job here, because if c takes d5, e takes d5, e5, um, this is a better version because this knight is very awkward. It's blocking the bishop. Who can propose a very nice move here using the pin? You can't sacrifice on e5. That's premature. But you can still use the fact that this pawn is immobilized and play knight d4. Excellent job. Where is the knight going? Well, look at this juicy weak square on f5. You can also sack the knight on e6. This is incredibly unpleasant for black. For example, if black just fianchettos the bishop, the knight slams into f5, this is a fork, this is total nastiness uh, on a grand scale. This is just a pretty common idea that you should sort of file into your, into your mental directory. 
And if black plays knight e7, trying to close down the e-file, knight e6, f takes e6, checkmate to his majesty. Check, checkmate. Yeah, knight e6 is just another one of those ideas to be aware of. Uh, if he doesn't take the knight, you know, you can get the bishop out. The, the black's position just totally collapses here. So to summarize, the x factor here is whether or not you have control of the e-file. Your opponent goes e5. And here I think, Max, you make the first instructive mistake. You played the move b4, and I think you're trying, you have your, your mind in the right place, but you forgot to make a move first. I would have taken first. I would have opened up the position uh, in, in as much as I could. And now b4 would actually be a brilliant positional move. This is the concept that I call carving out. You want the d5 square for your queen or for your knight. What's stopping us from being queen d5? Well, it's the pawn on c6. How do we get it out of there? Just shove this pawn down to b5 and undermine this pawn on c6, which cannot be defended by any other pawns. So I love this idea of b4, but it's very important to only do it once you've opened up the position. So this is a matter of getting your priorities straight. To your opponent's credit, he goes c5 here, keeps the position relatively closed. And here again, Max, I would just take the pawn. And, and I think that you overthought it a little bit here. And then I would get the bishop out to a3 and try to uh, get this knight out of c5. You're still much better here. Um, you're still much better here. What about d5 for black? Well, if black plays d5, you have to, you, you can't miss the forest for the trees here, right? Black is, um, you know, it's like trying to kill a dinosaur by uh, shooting a BB. It's like shooting a BB gun at a dinosaur. If, if that makes, that's a weird analogy. And one sec, I, I have like, I still have tea all over my desk, so. Let me just wipe this down a little bit. All right. So yeah, this is like shooting a BB gun at a dinosaur. Do you care about this knight on C3 being hanging? Nah, just play knight takes C5. This is totally crushing. What to do with G4 in which position text chess? Yeah, in this position, right? Yeah. Well, um, Daniel's style move would be b5. I would total. I would consider sacrificing the knight here because it's so important to get this d5 square under control. All right, guys, we can move on from the Kleenex. <laughs> knight f6 and then something like knight d5. We've got total domination over the center. Um, but guess what? You can also just go knight d2 here. What would be wrong with going knight d2 and then repositioning the knight to b3 maybe? I think that when people are learning chess, there is a natural aversion that a lot of people have to, to making these sorts of retreating awkward moves. And what I always say in these situations is remember that piece placement is temporary. You can almost always uh, reposition a piece that's awkwardly placed. Yes, it's going to take you one more move, but you shouldn't. that shouldn't be a deal breaker uh, and that shouldn't be a cause of panic, particularly because you, you have a big lead in development, so you can afford to take another move, and maybe even the knight jumps to a5 and attacks the c6 pawn that way. Yeah, but, you know, it only takes two moves, because uh, now the g4 pawn is also hanging, so your opponent is probably going to waste the tempo on its defense. Okay. So Rome wasn't built in a day, so b4, c5, and you played rook b1 here. a6... Uh, yeah, if I were your opponent, I would probably maybe go b6. But now, Max, you do take and go bishop a3. Excellent job. b5. Okay. So this is where things get juicy. Uh, you drop the bishop to f1. That is fine. I would consider also taking on c5 immediately. I would consider taking on c5 immediately because if he takes on c4, then uh, the b file has been opened. Where can this bishop go now? Where can this bishop go now? Bishop b6, exactly. And after the queen moves, who can propose a good follow-up? White's got a ton of good moves here. Who could propose a good move for white in this position? See, I don't think we need a4 because a4 is slow. You want to push the pawn to a5, but this bishop is perfectly well defended. Your opponent doesn't have the firepower to attack this bishop. Instead, you should notice how weak this pawn on c4 is. 
and find a way to attack it. So knight d2 is a great move. Just getting the knight to c4, and then you could do a little switcheroo, move the bishop back and get the knight into b6. Or you could play queen e2, very simple move. You could even play rook b4 here uh, and try to get the rook to c4 and then to c7. So a lot of the time, you just want to think more concretely, right? You want to identify weaknesses and attack them. That's one of the basic ways of thinking about any position. Uh, and knight d2 would be the move that I would play here. Okay. So you play bishop f1 first, no problem. Your opponent goes bishop d7. Uh, but rook b4 doesn't need to occur to you. I think rook b4 um, is, is the fancy move. Knight d2 is the move that I would play. No, the queen, queen on e2 is not doing anything apart from attacking c4, but it doesn't need to be doing anything except that it, it's winning the pawn. That's enough. Now, if black had taken on c5, what would be the Naroditsky style move here? I wouldn't just meekly retreat the bishop to f1. Here you have to sense that because you have such a big lead in development, the time has come to start sacrificing. The time has come to start just cracking through knight b5. This isn't even really a sacrifice. I mean, you get three pawns for the piece. And this is, sorry, and this is the sort of position that I would evaluate intuitively. I mean, look at, look at all of this. Knight c6 is coming in. You're pushing that e-pawn all the way to e6. Black has nothing developed. Uh, there's no calculation required here. It's just something you, you, you eventually start to sense uh, when you acquire experience in attacking chess. So I would say this was the more incisive approach. You played bishop f1 first, but your opponent goes bishop d7, which allows you to uh, win the central pawn. This still looks great, bishop g7. But now you see now your opponent starts to develop his pieces and uh, you might have missed the train here a little bit. Okay. So let me see. Now you decided on a very interesting approach. You played f4, g takes f4 and queen h5. Very creative, Max, very creative. So you're defending the knight and attacking f7 at the same time, fascinating. I love that idea. I think that's a brilliant idea actually. Um, but it didn't quite work out. We'll take a look at that. Was there something more simple available? Well, you could have also considered simply taking on d7. And well, if, if queen takes d7, how should white react in this situation? Yeah, definitely e5 followed by e6, totally crushing. And if bishop takes c3, this is again a case where you shouldn't miss the forest for the trees because it may appear that you're losing material and technically you are, but what would be the best way to respond here with black, with, with, um, with white? No, but <laughs> you can't play knight takes b5. Oh, but, I, but you meant in the other position. Oh yeah, knight b5 is even better, I agree. Sorry, I missed this move. Yeah, knight b5 is, is totally possible as well. Either move would be good. Yeah, just, just knight takes c5. Knight takes c5, bishop takes c1, queen takes c1. We've gotten rid of the fianchettoed bishop. This queen could reroute to c3. Again, just visually, white's position should strike you guys as totally overwhelming. And white has, uh, technically speaking, extra material. White's got what? Uh, seven pawns to black's five. So it's an exchange for a piece and two pawns. That's, uh, you know, we're up material and we're crushing here. So this is uh, totally overwhelming. So that would be possible. You went with f4 and queen h5, which I find to be super interesting. Okay, so your opponent played queen e7. Yeah, of course, bishop takes e5 would have not, would not have been possible because this is a fork. Um, queen e7. Okay, so now you take on d7. Bishop takes c3. And this leads to some very... Ah, but now... See, now the problem is you can't take on c5 anymore because the queen defends that pawn. So the knight doesn't have a very good way out of the cage. All right. So I don't think you're in big trouble here. But I think that... Um, well, I'm finishing in a moment, Parrots. So if knight b6, then rook b8. If knight b6, then rook b8... And you do have a very ingenious method of evacuating this knight. Does anybody see what I'm talking about here? Remember that, you know, don't look only for knight moves. Look for intermediate moves that open up squares for the knight. Look for intermediate moves that open up squares for the knight. Knight a4 doesn't work. Knight a4 doesn't work because he takes the rook and white's rook is overloaded. We have to take the bishop and then we uh, remove the pin. D6, bingo. Attack the queen and reposition the knight to the center. 
Bishop takes c1, rook takes c1, and white's got very obvious compensation for the exchange. White black's king has no safe haven. So I would prefer white here. Probably the computer could pull off some defenses, but I would say that white's position from a practical point of view is still very much playable. So that would be one idea. Another idea would be to play e5 and just say, basically, I don't care about any, any, of, the, any of this material. I'm going straight for black's throat and basically just going e5, this is probably on sound, and maybe something like e6. On the other hand, I'm not sure if we have enough firepower after something just like bishop back to c3. Yeah, I don't see I don't see a clear pathway here. E takes f7, queen takes f7. And the problem is this pesky bishop controls e1, and it also controls e5. So sadly, I'm not sure that we have enough here. So Max, you went with d6 immediately, but unfortunately he takes the knight and now black is winning. But the game goes on. The game goes on because your opponent blunders with bishop d4 check. And now excellent vigilance, rook takes d4 and queen e5 winning back the piece. Now you're still going to be worse in the end, but uh, this prolongs the game for sure. If I were black here, I would go knight f6. Knight f6 and unfortunately your attack fizzles out. Whoops, sorry, I keep doing that. Queen f3, bishop e5 and then black can safely castle. So never give up. Good tactical vigilance. Queen e5 check, queen takes h8. Unfortunately, you're still down a bunch of pawns here and it still looks pretty rough. So now you try to evacuate your queen, that's good. Thank you, Falk, for the sub. Your opponent kind of stumbles here and you win a bunch of pawns again. e5, queen takes f4, queen takes h6. So now you're basically in great shape again. Good job, queen g5, rook e1, this all looks very good. I'm going a little bit faster because I'm running out of time. Queen f4, bishop b2. This all looks great, Max. Okay, so here you had a pretty big chance. Here you had a pretty big chance. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're aware of this. Oh, you play this on the next move. You, you could have played e6 immediately here, um, winning another pawn. But you went bishop h5 first and then e6. That, that's also fine. Okay, so here you had a win on the spot. Max, can you spot it? And the rule in such positions, when you can sense that your opponent's king is on its last legs, you don't want to make any moves automatically if you can afford to. I imagine that you were, might have been in time pressure here. But if you see the bigger picture here, queen b8 check, knight c8, e7 check, and you know you can even make a knight or make a queen and this is winning. So uh, for those of you watching, you know this is a good example of not making any moves automatically and always sort of checking for other candidate moves. Uh, even if you do that for five seconds, I think you have a better chance of spotting queen b8 check because if you pre-move e takes f7, well, then you're not going to be able to... Now, this is still still winning, but uh, this is a little bit more complicated. So here, queen d6 check, correct. King c8. Queen takes a6, so you pick up another pawn. Queen d6 back. Yeah, now things start getting a little bit iffy. Hmm... Amazingly, it's not so clear how to uh, how to win. I mean, queen takes e7 would be, I would say, the simplest. Probably this is the simplest because you're forcing black to take with a queen. If black takes with a rook, then you win with queen e8 check and rook e7 check, and you take the queen. So when you're in time pressure, if you find a way to trade queens, that could be the most practically astute approach, and then you just start pushing your passers. The problem with rook e7 is you allow this nasty check, your opponent starts checking, ooh, and now, yeah, and now you blunder this rook f7, and this leads to quick checkmate. Sag, that's, uh, that's a rough one. I think if you run toward the center, you're probably still winning here, Max. If you run toward the center, his rook is totally immobile, so all you have to do is escape the checks by the queen, and you could probably do that maybe even running to g7. And one way that I play when I'm in time pressure and my king is in the center is I take a second to chart a target square for the king. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, where do I want my king to run to? And if you ask yourself that question, g7 occurs to you because, well, wouldn't you want to chase the rook away from f8? And you just run. You run to that square in any way that you can. King g4 also escapes the checks, by the way. So he should probably go here. But you basically run toward your target square or your target area, and that could really help you avoid the checks. King g6, block with a queen, 
queen takes c2, king g7. So that's a pretty good technique, even when you're not in time pressure, for finding ways to evade the checks. So this was a rough one. I think you played an excellent game, honestly. Um, to recap, in this position, the idea of opening the f file by pushing the f pawn, so move the knight away and then play f4, that's a very, uh, very um, typical and very important pattern to be aware of when your opponent plays g5. Um, d5 was excellent. Here, you know, try to keep your priorities in order. Your priority number one is to open up the position. So taking the pawn first would have been good. And, uh, you know, here, there were a couple of moments where you could have played a little bit more incisively. I feel like maybe you reacted a little bit too automatically to some of these, although you thought for a minute 54. So I feel like maybe you were considering a sack, but always consider all of the captures. Bishop takes e5. And then when you have this kind of massive lead in development, that's when you should start considering sacrifices that open up the position completely because that allows you to just uh, strike at your opponent before they get a chance to develop. Yeah, yeah of course. No, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, it's it's my pleasure. So bishop d7. And, you know, sometimes uh, you came up with a very creative idea, and I almost feel bad uh, criticizing you for this because of how creative this concept is. But... Sometimes just going for the simple approach and giving up a little bit of material, sometimes that's the best thing you can do, you know? Uh, sometimes these kinds of creative approaches uh, just give your opponent a little bit too much time to stabilize. Thank you, Agro Caller, for the prime. Yeah, this is about calculating further, exactly. So this is about calculating as far down as you can. If you had calculated to this point, I think you would have noticed that too many of your pieces is hang are hanging. You had an option of going knight b6 and d6. You know, this concept of opening up a square for one of your pieces by pushing out a pawn is important. You see this in a lot of different types of positions. Great job not losing hope and seeing rook takes d4. This is awesome. And, you know, phenomenal job recovering from, you know, that setback. You did just, you know, this stretch was flawless. You spotted e6. And, you know, maybe the most important lesson out of the time scramble would have been to uh, to take just a second or two and consider all the other candidate moves. It's easy for me to say that, uh, but when you do that, you alert yourself sometimes to the possibility of these knockout blows, particularly when the king is, is as weak as it is. And then finally, uh, going, you know, forcing the queen trade. As tempting as it might be to go for checkmate, just, you know, taking a second and forcing the queen trade could could allow you to win a game in, in even in, a, in an acute time scramble. So queen takes e7 here might have been the more practically, uh, you know, might have been the more pragmatic choice. And then finally, uh, getting the king to a predetermined square could be um, something to consider when you've got only a couple of seconds left and your king is getting hunted down. Again, easy for me to say, but uh, something to help you um, help you manage in such positions. Okay. All right. So definitely an excellent game. Thanks again for not being afraid to send in a loss. I know this was a painful one, but uh, this was a tremendously instructive game. So many interesting, uh, so many interesting things happened. Ultimately, remember that when your opponent pushes a lot of pawns in the opening, it is the right approach to open up the position, but you don't want to do that blindly. You want to do that in a very careful manner, because if you do it prematurely or you do it in the wrong way, you you're, you let your opponent close down the center permanently, and that could cost you the game. So I love that you played rookie one here uh, in order to prepare d5. That was very good uh, opening play. So nice game, man. Yvonne, thank you for the 500 and LD2775 for the four months. I have to run, guys. Thank you, everybody, for the support. Um, this was th these were two awesome games, Amanda and and Max. Thank you for submitting uh, such instructive games. This has been a lot of fun. I think this is the start of a very good series. I'll put this out on YouTube. So thank you guys so much for all of the support. It's much appreciated. I'm happy that people found this instructive. And thanks for hanging out. Take care and see you guys soon. Bye.